So let me start out over here. Of course, today's presentation is commercial motor vehicle diagnostics. And I call the beginning of a journey because diagnostics is one of those areas that uh, you just don't get it in a one hour sitting. So the premise is I'm gonna start with a little bit of basics, fundamentals. Uh, I got a case study or two, not, nothing totally, totally exotic okay and then i'll try to wrap it up with a little bit of a doing a little bit of electrical but no no this the this truly is a beginning because i'm going to start to migrate more and more and the diagnostics i'll be honest with you doesn't necessarily it's not necessarily going to apply just for strictly electronics and all that stuff because those of you that work on trucks oh my gosh you know you can get into a little bit of everything you know you get the shakes of the wheels i mean you got brake issues uh maybe you'll have tranny issues you know trannies especially today with electronic trannies and eventually of course a big thing that everybody has issues with including the dealers is uh the emissions portion you know the dpf and so on and so on so let's let's jump right into it okay. uh, this is me don't even worry about me hopefully you'll have it in the handouts too i mean i'm just i say that every time it's more important not what i do what i've done and believe me i'm old i've been around from everywhere you know but it more important is hopefully you walk away learning with something and i want to remind you too that uh this might seem like the fundamentals and you see it over here diagnostic fundamentals concepts i don't care at what level you are because some of the people watching this might be their first exposure to something like that and to be honest with you that is a huge trend with my two-day electrical classes and brake classes a lot of companies let's face it they're trying to get young blood in here and they figure it's a good exposure for all that stuff and hopefully the ones that you are you know you guys that are vet friends you know you'll still pick something up but uh, just be patient so this is what we're going to cover simple circuits using dv home case studies live demo okay so let's get right into it diagnostics one oh speaking of jim and if any of the other trainers are out there watching okay just so you and they'll know okay a lot of these next few slides this is we we collectively always we do a lot of stuff on diagnostics and kind of i'm t i'm picked on everybody's little good thoughts good way of doing it the good rules what to follow and everything so it's not just me putting all this stuff together i take it collectively from everybody you know a lot of good good people out there so anyway diagnosis is an art it separates technicians diagnosis is a way of looking at systems that are not functioning the way they should and finding out why also it is knowing how the system should work whether it is working correctly and this is i'm talking about starting right from the ground floor here following our basic rules should be followed to enable to find the cause of any condition set of conditions okay? right off the top guys know the system this means knowing how the system operates and what its limits are and uh to be honest with you a lot of times we, we're, we're lucky here we're working on cars on up to big tractor trailers loaders track vehicles whatever the case may be so that means maybe you guys are just like us at any given time something will come in a vehicle will come in Gee, I've never, never, never approached that vehicle first time in the shop, and we try to find some information. The most biggest information that we look for is most important information. How does the system work? And if you get good at this, if you can figure out how the system works, that right there is your first step. Otherwise, you're going to go in blindly. How it works puts it all together. The relationships of the components and systems. What did this engineer design? What, did, what was in the back of that engineer's mind? What were they trying to do with this? So you know where I'm going with this knowing what happens when something goes wrong i mean that's huge too you know a lot of this to be honest with you especially in the trucking that comes with experience guys that 
you know, again, it's like, oh yeah, I had that yesterday. Oh yeah, I know exactly where I'm going to, you know. Knowing how the parts are put together to make the system function properly. You know what, I'm not ashamed to say that at times it might mean on getting your hands on a system that is working properly, checking it against the one you are working on that is not working. Again, we're, we're talking about, you know, if you work on a model, constantly after a while you know like the back of your hand but if you don't you get all these different models years makes different types of vehicles coming in that is important eh? know the history of the system how old or new is the system has it been previously serviced in matter to cause a certain condition for years we've coined the word since you and I, I gotta tell you, in all honesty, I'm gonna stand right here, okay? I've had some vehicles come back, it's like, oh, you know, all of a sudden we got this new set of problems, and I gotta like, uh, oh, boy, well, it's since you, must be since I worked on it last. And that happens, come on guys, you're working on 100 vehicles a week, you're trying to do best you can, you're shorthanded, you're trying to keep everybody happy, so I'm the first one to admit it. If you don't admit it, you know, what kind of treatment has it had? And more so, I'll be very honest with you, you we're talking about commercial motor vehicles here. Not all drivers are kind to their vehicles, okay? If you have your own vehicle, let me tell you something, you're gonna treat it differently than if it was somebody else's vehicle all day long. Hopefully we have some really good drivers that will keep their vehicle running good, take care of it, look at all the telltale signs on the dashboards, if they hear noises and all that stuff, but not everybody's that way, you know? So, good communication with the driver. Driver is the one most apt to notice a change from what he, she is used to in operation vehicle. Now, good communication. Did the condition start suddenly? Did it appear gradually? Was it related to some other occurrences such as a panic hit and stop or another part that was replaced? This year, I often and find quite interesting here. Uh, if you have somebody coming in with passenger vehicles and you try to communicate them, a lot of times they're a little reluctant to tell you everything and I'm, I'm thinking the sneaky suspicion that I have is sometimes the more they divulge dollars and cents, the more it's gonna cost them. So, you know, hopefully that's not the case. But, however, you know, with commercial vehicles, it is good if you can communicate, okay? Now, you're trying to find clues. I'm not sure if you can read this, but however, I said hard to do sometimes if you work for a big fleet and you don't have the opportunity to question a driver. You know, driver leaves the DVIR, you know, he goes home. By the time you get the vehicle in, it's like, gee, I wish I could have talked to that driver and found out all that stuff. Sometimes it's like, whoop, no power. Brakes are bad. Okay, you know, and you guys know what I'm talking about here. Know the possibility of certain conditions happening. And that's huge. Most of the conditions are caused by simple things rather by complex ones. And I'm preaching to the choir, all the all you older guys that have been going through all this, you know for sure, okay, when it's all said and done, it's gonna be something stupidly simple. Okay, not all the time, but a good majority of the time. They tend to occur, occur in predictable manner or pattern. Examples, electrical problems usually occur at connections, not components. Engine no start is more likely to be caused by loose wire or minor component. We go through that a lot. Or adjustment rather than a broken cramshaft or camshaft. Keep in mind the difference between, excuse me, improbable and possible, that's huge. Because okay? you can waste a lot of time assuming a certain failure was impossible. It's one of those like Murphy's Law. When you thought you saw everything in your life, all of a sudden it's like, wow, I could not believe this actually happened here. You know, uh, this doesn't happen too often at all. Parts are really, really good out there somewhat. Okay. But keep in mind, could a new part be the cause of the problem? Okay? Now watch this. Of a $85 paper clip. The problem, the complaint was no proper cruise control, can't knock the cruise control off and everything else. And basically what happened was when there was no cruise control, when that happened, after spending a few minutes with the fuses, this is what we found. up 
there, there's a paper clip. It's where the clutch sensor is. I'm going to pull the paper clip off. Paper clip was magnetized to it. Climb back up there again. See by the RPMs. I'm going to turn on the cruise. You can see the RPMs climbing up, climbed up, I'm going to step on the clutch, RPMs drop right down. All because of this $85 paper clip, because that's what our hourly labor rate is, $85 an hour. Okay, all right guys, before anybody sends me stuff, $80, $85 an hour, so you know it's uh, just before COVID time, slowly but surely, I'm sure, I, I don't want to get into hourly rates, but we'll, we're well over $100 an hour, but this is one my son Brian found over there, you know, we could have spent hours trying to go into wiring and stuff, but it's one of those things, trying to use your head, you check the basics, and it's like, this does not make sense, okay, but it does make sense, because you get the drivers with their clips, and their paperwork and stuff, and where do they roll, where do they go, so I just wanted to throw that out there, that that not everything is always get your lab scopes and all that kind of stuff so you know first thing eliminate the obvious next move systematically until you pinpoint the source of condition follow process elimination to arrive at a factual conclusion you know what a hit and miss a random approach might work sometimes but a fixed sequence will always lead you to a proper conclusion you know so again this is huge. Don't cure the system and leave the cause. Okay? Just like adding air to a low tire doesn't repair the leak. Stalling new battery doesn't cure a no charge situation. Replacing warm brake linings doesn't always cure the cause of a pre uh, prematurely warm brake lining. Adding brake fluid doesn't cure the loss of brake fluid. Okay? And by the way, this we are in commercial vehicle, that applies to all fluids or air. I mean, it went someplace. You got to figure it out, you know. Be positive of your conclusions. Double check your findings, okay? Especially more so in commercial motor vehicles. Those drivers are more apt to come back next day and just, geez, I picked up this truck, I was scheduled to go on a run. It's like, didn't you double check to make it work? You know, whatever the case, whatever your means are, whether it's taking the truck out and all that stuff, you know? If you find a worn or broken component or something out of adjustment, stop. Ask yourself what could have caused this condition. Eh? Build a picture in your mind of relationships of parts. If one component is bad, could a mating component be also worn? You know, I mean, if you've got worn pins, chances are pretty good. The bushings are going to be gone, right? Just that mindset there, you know. Always road test a vehicle, and that we're going back to always road test a vehicle after completion work. Make sure the problem is indeed corrected, okay? Remember, it's very difficult to simulate road conditions while the truck is in the shop, you know. As a technician, keep it in mind, when you're diagnosing, you're expressing a relationship between logic and physical system and components. You need an organized approach, okay? Troubleshooting, and there's pitfalls all day long. I mean, let's not make it look like everything is just, you know, hunky-dory. I'm going to go three, through, follow all these little tidbits here. Trusting that a new component will always be good. We've all been caught with that, okay? Generally, it is true that a new component will be in good condition, but it is not always true. Also, it is possible for components to be mislabeled, thus having a possibility of having a wrong value. We've had that happen, Brian, a few times. You know, somebody, we've gotten it from a parts store, and somebody sent that part back over there to a parts store, and we got it back, and it's like, you kind of like maybe suspected, of, oh, gee, it looks like a box might have been opened or something, you know. I mean, you run across it all the time, not all the time, but once in a while, too, and you speak up whenever you, gotcha. yep. 
someone might have destroyed the component and returned it to the parts store as a wrong part to be resold to the next customer. Okay, and of course, unfortunately, that could be any one of us. Assuming there's only one failure for the problem, single failures, oh my gosh, they're ideal. Love those things. However, sometimes they do come in multiples. One component shorting out or having high resistance could cause failures to other components. There might be a component that is marginal that has gone undetected for a long time. Murphy's Law, if another component fails, the system will suffer from problems with both components. So again, there are some pitfalls. Some more, hitting a self into troubleshooting wall. This, this happens to me, guys, it can happen to anybody. If you say this never happened to you, you're not being honest. It is so easy to get so caught up in trying to solve a problem causing us to overlook crucial clues to the problem we're trying to solve. You know, frustration, I mean, you're, you're trying your hardest to figure this thing out and it seems like the deeper you get the deeper you get we we kind of sometimes maybe it's our human nature we, we have a hard time walking away from that problem and kind of like let's slow it down let's go backwards let's revisit something you know but that's me too I mean that's all of us you know take a break you know grab that coffee you know sit down figure it out Eh? let someone else look at it and 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 you know what brian and i do that once in a while i mean unbeknownst to each other he'll come over you know look at what i'm doing you know and he'll tell he'll point it out hey you should have done that you know of course i'll tuck my head in because i'm the dad but you know i'm just kidding you know but we do that with each other sometimes especially when you're trying to work on multiple jobs okay so, that's as far as a set of eyes go. Don't forget to reciprocate the next time that person says, well, now, I advise not to do team troubleshooting at the beginning of your diagnosis. Okay? Diagnosis involves multiple level thinking, it really does. That would be hard to communicate with another person, okay? My son Brian is huge on that. Once he starts into something, he kind of like, he needs to get his mindset. He needs to know what direction it is. And it kind of counterintuitive if somebody else is working with him. Well, do this, do that. Because once you start that path, you want to kind of stay on that path. So it would be nice to think that, you know, hey, two people working on it, okay. And of course, it can be less frustrating. Okay, uh, there are sometimes exceptions to the rule if both of you have complementary skills, electronics, mechanical, and so on. So, you know, coincidences? Oh my gosh, can two events occur at the same time? Yep, I think a lot of you people have seen that. Can both be from the same cause? Can they both be totally unrelated? You might have to duplicate the same condition suspected to be the cause. Then determine whether there's a relationship between events or no relationship whatsoever. So, you know what? If you're looking at these slides too, stop and think about it, okay? If you're doing diagnosis, I mean, that's not for everybody. And this is why sometimes, and you know, we're more like in the aftermarket over here, but I'll be very honest with you, that's why sometimes, especially once you get into the emissions and everything, a lot of these vehicles, they'll go into dealerships, they'll sit there a week, two weeks, they are no different sometimes us, you hit the wall, and it's like, where do you go? Eh? Question the troubleshooting work of others on the same job. This is not a put down of anybody else's skill. Now, you might not see it in your, if you have a shop that you're, you're done at the end of the day, but if you're, for example, in a fleet and you got multiple shifts and so on, the truck has to roll, you start on that job, the next shift comes in, they got to finish the job and they kind of have to carry over where you left. That does not mean that the first guy was on the mark. And that's why I said, this is not a put down. Again, this can happen, shift change. Verify troubleshooting data received from another troubleshooter before proceeding or start from the beginning. And we, we get that in our shop and I'm sure you guys get it from your shop. Somebody will come in with a vehicle. Hey, I had it over in that particular shop. They found this, they did this and we're, we, we've kind of gotten used to kind of not ignore it. Thank you for the information, but I'd rather start from the beginning myself. And just, just think about this, you know, 
if it came from another shop, why is it in your shop? Does that make sense? Eh? It's important to exchange information, but don't assume everything up to that point was checked that should have been checked before you get assigned a job. Now, here's another case study. And uh, this was very recently, within a month ago, right, Brian? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, uh, my son Brian worked on it. 2019 Freightliner M2 8.9. Not that it, it doesn't really matter. Don't even, you know, the year make, the diagnostics is the same. This came from another fleet. The issue is a no start, but it cranks, okay? Everything in the dash area was apart. They had tried diagnosing and fixing the issue and sort of hit a wall, okay? And the reason they hit a wall too is they are no different, and we're getting that from a lot of fleets. Now, they're shorthanded. They hired somebody that isn't quite up to snuff, but they made an attempt. So this is not a put down on that fleet, I'll tell you right now, okay? Now, continue, same one. They started with what they soon to be an issue and replace batteries ignition. You, you know, starting with the basics and rightfully so, the batteries might have been gnarly and everything else. And keep in mind too, when I do electrical, I need to remind everything. Everything you have on that vehicle has an electrical connection someplace. I'm talking about the engine transmissions and so on and so on, lights, everything, you know. It starts from the battery. You got a crap battery. Shame on you if you try to keep on with your diagnosis. But anyway, I regress. So they started, you know, with the simple stuff. Somewhat of a direction. And the reason was, again, it's a no start, okay? You need power and ignition of PCM. Now, not quite sure what led them to decide that this truck needed a wiring harness. And you can see over here, so when the truck came in, it came in with a new box wiring harness, and, and that's okay. They ordered it, not us, okay? Now, we had one of, Brian had one of his guys uh, get into the harness, and we discovered it was like, oh, we think it's a wrong harness, okay? So Brian took control. He followed through by physically following old harness to verify. So he figured it is wrong harness. But you know what? Brian's one of those guys. I'm in there anyway. We're trying to really keep this customer happy, by the way. They're no, their fleet that tries very, very hard to keep everything going. So might as well do a thorough visual, do basic checks, fuses, relays, using a digital ohm meter for tracing and stuff. So he started in the beginning following wires, numbers to the end and found the issues in the harness. I'm, I'm skipping a lot of steps for the sake of time over here, okay? The bottom line was he opened up the harness at a potential visually issue. You know, visually meaning he, I suspect a little problem here. It's rubbed in and everything else. And I don't know how close you can, if you can zoom in on that, you know, you got a connector here. Like I said, everything always winds up being with connections and so on, okay? Found the right numbered wire rubbing through the insulation, heading towards a PCM. Insulation rubbed through was enough to create oxidization. This is upstate New York. This is, we got the calcium chloride they wrote, use on the roads, you know, for salting and everything else. It's wreaked havoc for the last 10 years around here. So bottom line is repair, reconnected connector, PCM started truck approximately time one and a half hours and it did have other issues too after he got that but I'm just trying to point that out over here you know so now those of you that work on trucks okay you know we're kind of handicapped, you know. We don't have like some of the cars who with the colors and codes that you can follow. What you're looking at over here, this yellow over here, okay, you got a bundle of wires. I dare you, you might get near the connector and see a number for the wire, but now try to, try to follow the wires, you know, all the way to the end. And of course, you guys that work on this stuff, you definitely know how that goes all day long okay and this is where patience comes into play really it truly does you're just gonna you got to deal with it you got to do what you got to do with it eh? now I can tell you all day long about tools and everything else this probably explains it all by itself right and, and I did an x-ray and his gears really go that way. Just kidding. <laughs> All right. 
more pitfalls, pressure, time is money. We need the truck now. Those of you that work with fleets, you know, you know what I'm talking about. Keep one thing in mind, priorities, because I told you this is, yeah, we kind of talked about electrical, but you, you get into other aspects of the truck, you know, they're huge, bulky parts, things can go wrong, you know, what if the system you're working on can cause injury, loss of limbs? So I, I had to throw that in there, guys. Sometimes we get in a hurry, we're underneath there doing this, you know, and I made a little bit of fun here. Define hurry up, okay? Look, improper fixes performed in haste can lead to damages that cannot often be recovered, redone in a short time, if ever. As a troubleshooter, you need to avoid the pressure type of pitfalls. That means having interpersonal skills and communications to address pressure received from others. Okay? And it, it seems like when it comes to pressure, uh, it always, I don't know, that can be a training course all by itself. Now, not checking your test equipment, meters, when was the last time you checked the battery? When was the last time you checked the meter leads? When was the last time you checked the fuses? How about test these jumpers? This stuff here, like with the fuses, for example, when I do the electrical classes and I get into, you know, we get into using amps because I'm a firm believer in using amps, looking at power, wattage, because really that's what happens. When you turn that key on, it's going to take power. It's going to use up wattage. Engineers design these vehicles with that wattage and power in mind. So the first time guys will use their uh, digivolt ammeters in a class, all of a sudden they can't get a reading. You know, guess, you guessed it, it's a fuse. And that fuse might have been blown maybe the first day they ever bought it. I'm going to mess around with this meter in here. Never realized it blew. The pitfall of that is of course when you go to diagnose something else and you want to take some amp readings, it's like, whoop, there's no amps. I guess I have a problem, you know, and I'll get to the meter. Brian's laughing here. Yeah. Well, I remember a couple of days ago, someone doing electrical. Tests. Yeah, I know. <laughs> You're right. You know, I was, I was doing the ABS <laughs> and I was mad, you know. He's throwing it at me, guys. I was doing an electrical class and all of a sudden I go to turn on the meter, not electrical, ABS, and I'm on my ABS board that I built and uh, I'm turning it on. I say, oh, excuse me shit okay my fluke isn't working so i'm in a hurry i knew right away you know and uh brian can i borrow your meter you know so you know but anyway calibrating torque wrenches tire gauges air pressure vacuum so you, you guys get the trick last thought blame games don't cut it we all have different skill sets it's an electrical problem I shouldn't have been given this job. I'm mechanical and vice versa. And I've run into that years ago when I did some training uh, for one of our Metro people and uh, they sent guys in for air conditioning. Well, you know about air conditioning, okay? You got the mechanical aspect of it, you know, uh, the refrigerant and so on. And then of course there's electrical aspect, aspect to it. So they're in the class and a couple of guys that uh, strictly do I guess mechanical I'm not sure how they work but they 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 kind of like were complaining well we don't work on the electrical end and the guys with the electrical end were complaining well we don't do the mechanical end so I asked them I said well what do you do so when that bus or the rear it was oh no it was railroad it was a transit people so the mechanical guys say well if we put gauges on it ain't working we decide it's electrical we don't touch it we send you know we have to call over somebody that's electrical and I kind of like I went down there you know to those people I says this ain't gonna cut it guys you need to make up your mind because in my mind how can you work on one and the other not to make you an expert but they have to work together you know so but that's why i threw that in there too eh? look bottom line is we are doing this dance just once make it your best dance possible in life it's not always about the company equipment and what others think about you it's about you doing the right thing you know, walk away with that. Okay, you got that one dance over there. Now, 
Techniques, swap identical components. System has parallel identical subsystems. Swap the components between those two systems, subsystems. See if the problem moves with several swap components. We've done it, like I said, I'm not trying to make it totally electrical, but we've taken like whole uh, stuff on the wheel end, moved it to the other side, see if it changes and stuff. I'm just, you know, see if it follows it, you know. And of course, <coughs> you know, a lot of you guys have done it with injectors and stuff like that, you know, so there's nothing wrong it yeah if it does you just found the faulty component if it doesn't move on keep searching no the caution swapping a failed component with a good component could make the good component to fail also so you know if you're getting like something you're putting in it's got a lot of amp draw or something else and it's like you're putting someplace else it's like wow you know maybe you fried something what if there was high resistance resistance was reduced We're, we'll get into that a little bit causing a high current draw too much for the good components to handle and i'll try to get into that a little bit before we get quit here Removing parallel components. A system might have several parallel or redundant components. You might try to remove a component to see if this would cripple the whole system. If it doesn't cripple the whole system, start removing the components one at a time to see if things start to work again. You know, I know you guys are into trucking and stuff, you know, but with smaller vehicles and stuff, just think about that. You know, communi communications network between several computers, right? You got so many computers working together, you know, multiplexing and all that stuff. None of the computers are able to communicate with each other. And this is just, I'm keeping it simple, guys. You know, I'm keeping it simple, depending on the system and stuff, that will vary. But just for the sake of simplicity, try unplugging computers one at a time from network see if the network starts working again last unplugged computer could very well be the problem jamming the network by constant data outputting or noise and it, this is just an example okay you know but you need to get comfortable with that kind of stuff simplify the system the most complicated computer is nothing but a switch a switch with no moving parts requires no physical human action. You don't have a bunch of toggles you're working. The computer does it all for you. It receives input data from various sensors or demand command devices. It makes it or demand command command devices. You know, it makes, uh, I got to reword that. It makes an appropriate decision and acts upon it to make various changes via solenoids and other electromechanical devices. You know, usually only one Porsche system will have a problem. Break your diagnosis down to affect the portion. Isolate the portion's wiring. Why mess around with those hundreds of other wires, wires and components diagnostically, of course, to simplify your troubleshooting. Isolate and conquer. Capturing. Think about having instruments that can capture, record data and signals. This is very useful to try to catch intermittent problems. Don't you just love it? The minute you turn your back, the problem occurred. This is why we never take pee breaks. I'm just kidding, guys. You know, that's where the recorders wind up, you know. It's like watching the water boil. You're just standing there, you know. When is this going to happen, you know? High percentage electrical electronic system problems are caused by wire connections that are... And this is true. I mean, it's, I've been doing this, I don't even want to tell you how many years, you know. Uh, somebody wrote, you know, school bus had all white wires with numbers. There you go, you know. So, uh, connections that are shorted, open, or have high resistances. Think about the hostile environment they're exposed to. I mean, these are commercial motor vehicles, guys. And, and, Automotive, automobiles do the same thing. Vibration, corrosive atmosphere, heat, and of course we can we can spend hours just on what about bad repair practices, guys. That's another one of those sensu things. Eh? Connection points are more prone to problems, greater risk of failure. Low voltage connections tend to be more troublesome than high voltage connection systems. High voltage connection arcing just you know, think about this, can quite often blast away insulating layers of corrosion dirt. Low voltage system, I mean, when we start to get into computerization, and you look at those little itty bitty pins that you have in a computer, it's like, are you kidding me? We're actually going to pass voltage and current through those pins, you know? So, 
Low voltage tend not to generate high arcing when it's breaking to cause cleaning action. They also tend to be more sensitive to high resistance in the circuit. And that high resistance is a huge, huge, huge issue in our industry, whether it be in automotive, whether it be in trucking, whatever the case may be. Okay. Likely failures, opens are more common than shorts. Okay, and I love it when some people come into our shop and they're over there like, you know, I think I got a short. What well, makes you think? It's like it's not working. Well, does it come on a little bit, you know, or something? Yeah, so I think I got a short. You're trying to tell me you got to open, but I <laughs> just, yeah, those seem to be the most common words no matter what comes in. I got a short. Okay? Shorts do still plague technicians, you know. Many shorts are caused by degradation of wire insulation. We, we already discussed heat vibration and so on. Shorts can also be caused by conductive buildup across terminal strip sections on the back of printed circuit boards. Okay. Shorter wiring can occur when a conductor accidentally makes contact with either earth or chassis ground. You know, not necessarily, it doesn't have to be a high voltage system where a fuse or circuit opens up. Could make just enough contact to change the voltage present between other conductors in the circuit and ground. And these are, you know, this is real live stuff here, guys. Okay. That's when weird and bizarre system malfunctions occur. Okay. And again, this is the most simplified in my ABS thing. I have a whole sequence where somebody spent, uh, I believe it was like 10 hours total and wound up bringing it here. And with what, what was it, Brian? Within 15 minutes, we found the problem, you know? So, you know, and, uh, but again, you can see all that stuff, you know? And of course, we live into electronics and stuff. You know, I, to be honest with you, not, not to be a wise guy, but I, I was looking when I put this together for this one video we had years ago, suspecting an ECM problem, and I actually went out there, we had the hood open, the vehicle was running, right? I wrapped that computer and all of a sudden it started running not too bad again, you know? Wrapped it again, it was going, bop, 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 you know, so, you know, again, Maybe I shouldn't say that. Maybe that's not the way to diagnose stuff, but you know. Sometimes you have to get creative, you know, sometimes. And if you look over here, I was trying to figure out an ABS issue on a vehicle, you know, I had to add resistors in there, you know, just when you think AC voltage is coming up, this is kind of the, this particular sensor is kind of like a Hall effect type of a sensor. So I had to rig something up, get voltage to it, and I had to watch it as you turn the wheel, 0 0.65 to 3.91 volts. So sometimes you gotta get creative. Eh? What about recalls? What about service bulletins? I'm always amazed with the number of new vehicles with safety recalls. I get them every Monday. You know, so it isn't us guys sometimes causing problems, but they can come right from the factory that way. Eh? Tool-wise, look guys, this is just a, not every shop has their own favorite tools. These are just, I'm just showing you some stuff, you know, gauges, digital volt ohm meter, amp pro, temp pro, scan tools, smoke machines, video cameras, boroscopes, oscilloscopes. You know, throughout the years, they've all, they all have their own function. And the bottom line is though, whatever tool you have, you need to be comfortable with them, okay? These like, lab scopes and stuff you know there a lot of it is button knowledge getting in there you know we have a j pro we have a can can do over here you know there's i'm not trying to disguise as better and all that stuff here you know we can get some stuff out of the can do that we possibly might not get out of there and so on everybody's working a little but both of these have worked very well for us over here they really have you know and of course uh, I got the thermal imaging camera. This always comes in handy. And of course, I got the old uh, borescope. This is a digital one and so on. So, you know, and of course, if you're into, uh, if you're into diesels, the refractor meter for over here to try to, uh, you know, look at DEF and all that stuff. And I can go stupidly simple. I still love my test light to go in there. If I got some light issues or something. And the reason I pointed out this logic probe, the logic probe is actually a nice tool too. Real fast, you can go in there someplace. If you've got a crank sensor or a cam sensor, it basically does the digital thing. You know, shows low voltage, it'll flash the lights and stuff. 
cheap, 40 bucks, you know, just to see, oh, it is flashing, it is going high and low, I need to move on possibly, you know, so. Again, whatever little things help, these wind up being nice, a lot of relays in the systems and so on. So now I'm gonna do a little basic electricity here and I'm trying to watch the time too over here, okay? So I'm gonna do a, just, this is just the start of it guys. And then I'm gonna do some hands-on just to the fundamentals, okay? Now, I know everybody knows there's a battery, there's a switch and a load, okay? This is just a reminder here, you know. Everything starts with the source, 12 volts, of course, if it's running, it's gonna be 13.5 or whatever the case may be, you know. And then you're gonna have some kind of a switch and you notice I put in here, okay? Controller, substitute that, PCM, ECM, BCM, AB, ABS, and of course you could have the toggle switches, push switches, whatever the case may be. And then of course you've got the, now I said here, a designed resistance. I don't care what you're doing here, motors, lights, solenoids, and so on. Some engineer designed that into. And without me getting too far into and trying to make it a huge thing here, Unfortunately, you guys know that between here and here, or between here and here, you could have some issues, and that's that unwanted resistance, because this is, again, a designed resistance over here. And that gets to be fun, trying to figure out why is this motor not spinning as fast as it should, why is this light kind of dim, and so on, why aren't my solenoids tithering the way they should, they're not ramping up and I mean opens up poker but it all starts with this basics here this here is a series circuit okay one of the most fundamental circuits we have out there and I'll get to that now I don't I'm not gonna get into Ohm's law per se stupidly complicated I do not necessarily spend days in it but really get everybody comfortable in it because one of the things I try to tell everybody is like when me, G or Jim, any of those guys, Jim Wilson, anybody that does electrical courses, I me personally, I and they'll tell you the same thing, hopefully when you get through with this electrical course, you, and this is picking a digital volt ohmmeter of course, is the typical person goes over there and puts it on a circle circuit excuse me and is going to come back with a reading okay then you're going to take the reading and you're going to go someplace for information is, is this a correct reading for it if you get good at this okay what we try to teach all of us trainers here what we try to teach is that you know what when you go to that circuit, anticipate, anticipate what your meter is gonna tell you, you know. And that Ohm's law definitely helps you. You know, I figure I should get about five ohms here. You follow what I'm saying? I'm figuring because of this circuit here, this particular solenoid should have a low resistance, okay? And that's what you look for. Okay. It gets you that first quick start in here. So real fast, it's all it is, it's a relationship. One volt of pressure used to push one ampere current to one ohm of resistance. Is it important? Yes, 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 yes. The reason it's important, as voltage on a circuit increases, so does the current if resistance does not change. If voltage remains the same, but resistance goes up, the current will go down, okay? The reason like this is now, I can predict what my meter reading should be. And we'll get to the meter reading so short here. Not gonna make a huge deal out of this. This is a stupid series circuit. We're gonna go do that live. Current is constant through the whole circuit, okay? All day long through this whole thing, okay? Current must pass through each component. Current, the electrons, we gotta do work. Those electrons, they're gonna start here, they're gonna go through here, they're gonna go through here, they're gonna go through here, and they're single 
single wire systems is what we have in the trucks. The chassis is your ground over here. So pretend here's your chassis over here, you know. Then you could have dedicated grounds going to components. But my point being is if I put my ammeter here, just hypothetically, I didn't even do the numbers here. Hypothetically, if my ammeter says two amps here, that's my ammeter is an electron counter. I put it here, two amps over here, put it over here, two amps over here, two amps over here. Current is determined by total resistance, so in a series circuit, I would have to figure out all these resistances, okay? Then I'll know exactly uh, what the current is through the circuit. Applied voltage, and that's huge, guys, that helps in our vo doing voltage shop. 12.6, do the math, 6.3, 6.3, because I have two components here. Did I use up the source voltage? Absolutely. And each resistance in a circuit will use up its share, depending, of course, on its resistance. You know, you might want to call it a voltage drop. The sum of all voltage drops will equal applied voltage, you know. Parallel circuits, I can spend hours on that, okay. Basically, here's a typical circuit. You know, your lights on your trailer, on your truck, you know, your marker lights over here. Current has many paths. One path, two paths. Each path is going to take 12 volts, okay? Total current flowing circuit will be determined by the total resistance in the circuit. That's where we differ. Let me go back over here. Total resistance. So hypothetically, if this was 2 ohms, this was 2 ohms, I would add it up. This would be 4 ohms. And I can go on and on and on and on. I add up the resistances. This is where it gets funny here, okay? Total resistance will be will always be less than the smallest resistance in the circuit. I have one path has six ohms, one path has two ohms. I don't have to do the math or anything else. I'm gonna tell you right now, if somebody told me or if I took resistance readings here with my meter, when it's all said and done, okay, my anticipation is that it will always wind up being total. It's not two and six is eight. Whatever my total resistance will be less than two ohms. And we're gonna do that in a second. So now, real fast, cause I'm gonna go and do some live stuff. We got about 10 minutes left yet. Digital volt ohm meter. This is a typical meter here. Little tip here, guys. Get comfortable doing get comfortable doing amp readings and stuff because the amps they'll actually tell you a lot they'll tell you if the system is working if you take an amp reading it'll right off the bat this fast you'll know is it getting current are my wires intact and so on okay without you doing anything else you break in there you do it real fast and if you're getting amp reading that means you got power you got ground and your component is taking a draw you know, I'm trying to keep it stupidly simple. If it isn't, then of course, your next step is to find out where my issue is. But also, there's a relationship between resistance and amperage, okay, it's huge. Okay? And, you know, usually I'll, t I'll stand here and I'll say, if this is, if you back up a little so everybody can see, if, if, if this is my resistance over here, and this is my amperage, keep it stupidly simple. Resistance is down, amps goes up. If my resistance is high, amps go down. And this is electrically, by the way, okay? So if that's the case, okay, you can figure out, do I have an unwanted resistance, you know? But anyway, if you start using meter, think about, make sure you know which pockets you're doing, because you've got multiple choices here, resistance, voltage, amps, and that can be another, we'll slow it down, okay? So we're gonna do some live demos here. Let me make sure, School Bus has this, hello from South Carolina, where did I find handout? Okay, now I'm gonna start, uh, I believe I'm gonna start with that board there. I'm gonna put this, use this meter. I'm gonna put this meter on amps over here. Now, if you look at this board, okay, I have a common bus on top, I have a ground on the bottom. Now I do have a switch here. There was a fuse in there. Let me reach around. 
okay? There was a fuse in here like this, but what I did was I took the wires out of here, okay? So if you can zoom a little bit closer, this is a series circuit. Came from here, B plus, went in here, went through my control switch over here, and went this way, okay? It went through the light bulb over here, came back out, went to this other light bulb, and came back out over here, and it went like this. Okay, so I have a series circuit. So you can tell me, and I'm not near the chat box, how many places can you think of where a series circuit is? And if you put in starter, perfect. But you can think of anything else that I'm directly controlling it, going straight to it and giving it juice. Now, instead of my fuse, I pulled it out. I hooked up my leads over here and I put this on apps. So when I turn this on, if everything is correct, I got a battery hooked up. You saw my amps and you can zoom in over here, okay? There's my amps. Okay? But wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. If you notice, this bulb is lit, this one isn't. And I said current had to go through here. When I do my classes, right away, guys are going, there, well, there's something wrong with the bulb. There isn't. There is absolutely nothing wrong with that bulb, okay? Right? Now there's something wrong. I took that bulb out of the circuit, okay? So we'll put this back in over here. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to shut this off, and I think I have this on resistance. Let me find my leads here. I got a real cluster over here, guys, trying to set this up. So I want you to look. Everything's dead. Always make sure you got no, no uh, current going through, no power, no voltage to whatever you're doing. So I'm going to put that here. Okay? And what am I reading? Two, two ohms, 1.9, fluctuating back and forth. Okay. Now I'm going to put this over here. Okay. And what do we got over here? 6.8, 7 ohms. So let's think about this. I'm gonna put this live again. And by the way, I'll do a voltage drop as long as we're here over there, okay? So that was my resistances. This is very low, high resistance, right? And let me switch this over to volts. Is it, can you see from there, is it on volts? Yeah, all right. So I can do a voltage drop, definitely, this took a voltage drop, 12.2, hardly nothing, is it? Okay. So now, think about this. If this was a starter circuit, what if this was a solenoid or some wire connections over here? And this took a lot of the voltage. Remember that each you know, we have two two areas, you know, that unwanted resistance. This took a lot of voltage. I might not have enough left over here to what? Crank the vehicle over. And Brian just reminded me you had one in the other day, didn't you? Oh, yeah, with the grounds. With the grounds yeah. and everything else, okay? Yeah, cranking real slow. Cranking real slow, okay? So this is the way you want to start looking and thinking about... Uh, circuits now I'm gonna move over to the other board did this thing go out give me two seconds here uh, okay I'm back over here now on this board here would you be able to see it pretty good okay this board here this is a Curian N2 okay now I gotta watch myself make sure I'm putting the right pockets in because again I'm flying high guys I'm flying high over here not worried about power over here right now okay now what I have here is okay if you look at the resistances here I have three resistors okay so I got nine points you know what round it off 10,000 ohms right let's do this one here 983, let's call it a thousand ohms. This, and we'll put this into 97, 96, 100 ohms. 100, 1,000? 10,000. Yeah, 10,000, right. Okay, thank you. So now, 
I'm in series over here. So I'm going to go from the top, okay? Let me go from here to here, okay? And I got 10,800 some. So if basically, if you added all these up to 10, 1, 100, that's what we came up. That was in series. But now, let me put this into parallel. So basically, I need to connect these here, okay? I'm doing pretty good over here. Okay? So I'm building a parallel circuit over here. Okay? Stop me if I blow this up, Ryan. Don't want to let the smoke out. Never let the smoke out, guys. Now I'm in a parallel circuit, okay? Eighty-six ohms. What was the rule with parallel circuits? Total resistance will always be less, right? Than any of your resistances in your circuit. Now I want to do something real fast here, okay? I want to add, okay? By the way, just so you know, as long as I'm over here, this here came out with roughly around 3.5, 3.6 ohms over here. Does that make sense? Okay, so let me do this. Let me actually add this into the circuit here. This bulb. You're gonna love this concept here, guys. Now, I'm going to take a reading again of my parallel circuit. Now, I added this bulb in here. It brought it down and it's fluctuating a little, but take my word for it. It's, it's going to be less than what the original is. You know, basically, I got a few issues, but it's going to be less than what this bulb is. Now, where would you see this bulb over here? I had the picture of the test light, didn't I? Everybody will tell you, okay, whenever you go through any trainings, that when you use a meter on computer systems, okay, you don't, you want to make sure, excuse me, you want to make sure you use a meter in any of your computer circuits, okay, because you got 10 meg ohm impedance. Do not use a test light, okay? What I just showed you here is, and I'm going to stand back again here, is now you're using your test light, and I could be off on that. I brought that resistance down, didn't I? Think of how many circuits inside your computer are parallel circuits. Oh, they're, they're series parallel, parallels, and so on. They're knocked down to microamps and everything else. So what happens here is, and I'm going to do this again, you're fine, okay? A little bit of a reminder. Resistance goes down. Amperage goes up, right? So if my amperage goes up and you're going to shoot high amperage into your computer, you're going to have some issues. Now, what happened? Again, it depends on how you're putting your test light in there. But this is why, you know, and all the other trainers that are over there, G brings that up all the time. Again, a lot of computers don't have overcurrent over voltage protection so unfortunately if you got a solenoid that's going to draw a lot okay it's going to ruin that computer fry it you need to make sure that we're back to cause and effect that the reason the computer fried you might have had a solenoid that had too much draw and so on and so on okay and this is why you got to stop if you get into these pricey pricey computers you know and again some computers will have that protection i know abs computers have some protection they're pretty good at over current and over voltage but even they try to limit themselves down to two amps uh i know we're getting you know uh oh beautiful srs impact sensors neutral safety switch Older vehicle dome light, Jim. Absolutely. <laughs> awesome, 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 guys. We're 
we got about an hour. We just finished everything up. I'm going to wrap it up because I'm thinking with the Thanksgiving coming up, everybody needs to get right back. I know we do, you know. But uh, I truly hope everybody enjoyed this or, or got something out of it, okay? My, my problem with doing the Lunch and Learns is that we're... Uh, in one hour, you know, you can only do so much. And, you know, any of the trainers like Jim that's on there, he can tell you that, you know, it takes, you know, it takes a little bit more time like that, you know. And, of course, this is why Dorman products, oops, let me hit the slide here one more time, okay. Again, this is just the beginning of our journey. Next few Lunch and Learns will continue with diagnostics, okay. I'll leave this on, okay. If there are any questions, I'll try to take them but <clears throat> G Truglia from Dorman products he actually took over all the trainings and stuff for them and uh, I think we've often talked about maybe getting some real world uh, 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 you know real world stuff training do some live stuff that's geared more for uh, for the truck and commercial motor vehicle stuff so you know you can get a hold of him or me, whatever the case may be. So, you know, and, and that's what I meant. Uh, Roger over there says, enjoy. It doesn't ever hurt to have a refresher. You know, good, good, good responses. I appreciate that. Well, we're going to shut off the recording, but I'm going to leave the chat on for a couple minutes here, you know, and just in case anybody has anything else. So, well, thank you very, very, very much. Enjoy the rest of the week. Enjoy. Hopefully you'll be back next month. So thank you. Yeah.